On today's episode of the show, we have Coach Tommy Kanichis. He is the new offensive coordinator at St. Mary's University. Um, Tommy, thanks for being on the show. Appreciate you having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, for sure. So you want to give us a little bit of your background. You know, you've had a, an interesting start to your, your coaching career and transitioning like a lot of guys do from a, a youth sports athlete to a youth sport coach. What's that been like? And kind of walk us through that journey. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun. So I uh, I started playing my youth sports career at Carleton. I did uh, four years there. I was part of the Rebirth program in 2013, um, which was a whole lot of fun in itself. Um, while I was at Carleton, I started coaching in the community with the Ottawa Sooners um, in the OPFL, as long with their uh, CJFL program and helping a little bit with the NFC stuff as kind of a consultant. Um, coached in other areas there with, um, you know, NACAFA and other all-star games in the Ottawa area. Um, <clears throat> after that, I... Uh, was lucky enough after my playing career at Carleton to get invited to Waterloo as a guest coach by uh, Darrell Adams, their defensive coordinator and recruiting coordinator, assistant head coach. So I went out to training camp there, and after a couple days, uh, Coach Bertoya offered me a job to come on as offensive line assistant. So uh, it was one of those things I kind of I couldn't say no to. So I dropped everything back in Ottawa and and hopped on board with the Warriors. Um, after a few you know a few weeks with the Warriors, I realized that we were doing something pretty special there. Um, you know, prior to the, the season I got there, they were having some struggles three years, 0 and, 0, 0 and 8 straight. And then, uh, you know, my first season there in 2017 uh, was our first year going 4-4. Four and four. So it was a big turnaround year, a lot of excitement. Then I spent the next three years there uh, taking over with the running backs, the running backs coach, um, still assisting with the O-line quite a bit, kind of playing between both positions. And then um, this past season, but back in March, I was uh, lucky enough to get hired on by St. Mary's University the offensive coordinator. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, it's certainly been an impressive thing you guys have done uh, there at the University of Waterloo, and it's nice to see young guys getting opportunities, you know, to, to continue to grow. And I think there's a lot of guys, you know, that go from playing that are looking for football to still be in their life. And, you know, I think in the States it's so simple, right? If you meet someone in the grocery store and you tell them you're a football coach, they don't bat their eyes. You know, like that's that's a totally, you know, people grow up doing that. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in Canada, there's there's less, the, the pathways there are a little more complicated and there's certainly not as many, you know, opportunities. So I think it's it's cool. And there's certainly been a lot of young guys, you know, recently in the OUA, obviously where I have most of my experience that I've seen that are doing a really good job. So, you know, obviously it's, it's cool to see that. And, um, you know, I certainly have gotten to see a lot of your work from the other side of the street at, at Laurier and, and – yeah. It's exciting to see, you know, that battle of Waterloo's really become a battle again, and that's that's Absolutely. been a fun thing, you know, the last couple of years, and I'm, I'm sure will continue to be in the future. So, Without a doubt. yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. So my my big question, kind of for today, which I post to you and I talked about coming on, is talking a little bit about offensive philosophy and and how you develop a playbook. Certainly, as a as a guy that's going into his first year as as an OC, that developing a playbook thing is is I'm sure some that's on your mind. Um, so it's a big question. How do you kind of take that, your personal philosophy and then work that into who you are as an offense? Yeah. So I think, uh, I think you nailed it right off the start right there. I think it all starts with your personal philosophy. Um, you know, as, as coaches, we're all individual people who have our own ideas and our own, our own characteristics and philosophies. And, um, I think your playbook is kind of your storybook, like any other writer. Um, you know, it kind of gets to show what you believe in and why you believe in it. But I think, um, you know, if I were to kind of put them in, you know, dot jots of, of philosophy, I think it all starts priority for me as a player group, um, you know, starting to know who your players are, evaluating your players, uh, finding their strengths and their weaknesses and basing your playbook around that. Um, again, that's, that's my philosophy towards it. It, it differs for other people, but uh, you know, to me, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I believe, you know, 60% of your playbook, should be based off of our own concepts and our own ideas that we as coaches believe we can implement with the group that we've seen off of film. I think that other 40% or, you know, 30%, if you're going to put it to 70% percentage, it, uh, it comes from our player group. I think them on the field showing us what their skill set is and forcing me to develop concepts around them um, is something that, you know, I'm looking forward to and I think is extremely important in development of, of a team and, and an offense altogether. It shows them that, one, we're paying attention to what you're doing as a player group, at the end of the day, they're the ones on the field performing. We're just calling the plays. Um, you know, what am I doing to make sure that you're set up for success? And I think it's, like I said, it starts with 
building concepts and, and developing plays around our athletes. Um, I would say for me, that's kind of the, the number one thing overall uh, in terms of philosophy and, and developing a playbook. It has to be player focused. You know, the, the same old cliche we've heard a hundred times, never put a, a square peg in a round hole, right? Find, find what your guys are good at, what their strengths and weaknesses are and evaluate and base your playbook off of that. Um, kind of secondly to that, I think it's simplicity. You know, I've uh, seen a lot of players that really, really struggle with paralysis by analysis, overthinking. Um, you know, I was one of those players, and it kind of took me after my playing career to realize that. Um, so I, I really want to try to find ways to eliminate it. And there's tons of different ways to do it. It's, you know, naming conventions for memorization purposes um, or, you know, just actual teaching. I'm a big believer in teaching conceptually. Um, rather than having players memorizing plays, I want them to memorize concepts, the whys and the whats behind what we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, what is what is inside zone? To some guys, you know, if you're talking O-line play, it's, it's a double team up to your linebacker. Okay, good to know. But what is the overall picture of what we're trying to achieve? Right, same thing if we're talking anything, in, you know, our crossers concepts in the pass game, or our flood concepts, or our verts concepts. Okay, it's it's all good to know in our verts concepts. We're trying to win over top. That's great. Everybody, anybody can tell you that. But what is on the grand scheme of things? What are we really trying to achieve in terms of our spacing? How do we want to leverage certain people? You know, how do we want to get over top, and why do we want to get over top in a certain way? Why do we need inside releases and outside releases? What is the grand scheme of what we're truly trying to achieve? Um, to me, in, in my teaching, I'm a big believer that we have to teach a concept instead of instead of play. Um, and then, uh, kind of from there, like I said, I think the the third, you know, most important point to me is that it's fun. I want my guys having fun playing ball. We all grew up falling in love with the sport, and we're now coaches today because we love the sport because it's fun. Um, you know, I never want to steal that away from guys. And I think, you know, obviously, success and winning breeds fun. We all know that. But if we can find ways to to create fun new ideas, new concepts that are different, you know, what I like to call, you know, getting a little bit greasy with it in our play calling. Um, I think that creates an avenue for guys to really enjoy themselves and excel on the field. Yeah, I think that that's such a huge piece. And, you know, those three things really create a belief from your players. You know, I think we've all at one time or another as a player probably been in a scheme where we thought, hey, like, you know, I get why people run this, but this isn't good for the, for our, the group we have. You know, um, and that can create that doubt or, you know, what you're supposed to do on a play, but you have no idea what's going on around you because you don't understand the concept. Like you said, that, you know, that creates a ton of doubt, you know, and then you just get that lack of motivation when you're not keeping things upbeat, fun, you know, new and challenging for the guys. I think that that really deters people from putting their effort into learning the concept and understanding everything that you're doing. So, you know, I think those three ideas really play well off each other and, it's just it's hard to be successful, um, especially when you don't have those pieces put together, right? If you're mm -hmm. trying to run something that that your guys don't believe in, it doesn't matter how much you know about it or how well you know you feel about it. If your guys aren't having fun and knowing what everyone's doing, then it's tough to be successful. I think I think you'd hit it right on the head with belief. You know, I think that's the belief is everything at the end of the day. You know, it's, um, you know, we've all been in games as whether coaches or players where you're in a tight situation, it's late in the playoffs. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can attest to it in 2016 with the Yates, you know, late in the game, come back against Western, uh, you know, when you guys shouldn't have come back, but it was a belief from what I saw, I'm sure you could speak to it way more than I can, but a belief amongst that team that like, we can still do this. And then you did it, you know, that, that buy-in, that belief, and not only your, your teammates, but your coaches and what they're sending, the message that they're sending. If we, if we can get everybody to buy in, that buy-in is something that's always talked about in every program. But I think it, it stems from more than just the words coming out of a coach's mouth or the leaders. You know, it's, it's the actions. It's the playbook. It's the characteristics. It's the reward. It's the recognition. Um, it's all of those things that bring that belief in. But again, like I said, it all starts with, okay, here's our center, which is our playbook. You know, the first thing you're going to get when you walk into training camp is your playbook. You're not going to get to know who I am yet. You're going to see a playbook. That's your that's your welcoming. Okay, what do we got here as you're flipping through it? Can I start to buy in right away based off what I'm seeing? And the, the hope is yes. Um, but like I said, to me, that's kind of, as coaches, that's our journal. That's our book. And I'm, I'm opening to you as a player with my journal, my playbook. Um, so, I, yeah, I think belief is is everything. If we can get guys to buy in. I think we, we can be, that's where success comes from. 
And I think there's a lot of stress, you know, again, like as young coaches about getting guys to buy in and believe in you. Like, I think sometimes, you know, you feel like, oh, this guy's, you know, won X amount of Yates Cups or, you know, he mm-hmm. played in the CFL as a player. And there's some credibility that comes along with that. But the best piece of advice I got as young coaches, the guys will trust people that can help them get better. So mm-hmm. you just need to create that belief over time. And I think it comes through exactly what you're saying. If you can communicate a concept, right, that's going to buy you credibility with the players. You're going to create belief in that player, not just in you, but in, hey, this relationship between me, my teammates, my coaches, um, it can mm-hmm. help us be successful on offense. So, you know, I think that's a really good point, especially, you know, in today's day and age, you know, you can look, especially right now, people are at home and, and have access to stuff across you know, across Canada, across the States, you can learn any offense you want. You know, I was watching Ohio State defensive film this morning, right? Like it, there's so much out there for you. How do you, so you, you've kind of talked about your philosophy in terms of how you want to build your playbook. How do you then, okay, now I know who I want to be. How do you get to that? Okay. What do I want to do? And obviously matching it with your players is important, how do you how do you kind of balance what you've done before and what you kind of believe in system wise with, you know, maybe bringing in some concepts that that really feature your players? Obviously, you know, you've gotten to work with some unique guys and and working with uh, the four brothers and stuff at at Waterloo and some some other elite players there. How how do you kind of match your beliefs with what is what you feel is best for that group in front of you? I think uh, it's one that starts with evaluation, right? Um, you know, a big part of me, you know, accepting this new job was after watching the film. Um, you know, I, I spent hours watching their film, multiple games, um, you know, seeing what these who these athletes are and what they're capable of, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. And is it a team that I believe, um, you know, I can, I can walk in and be successful with? You know, not necessarily day one, but can I go to this program and work with who we have as athletes um, does it fit to my philosophy, you know, the, my background of what I'm teaching? I'm not going to go in there and teach something I don't know, right? So um, I think, you know, seeing what I saw on film from the, the athletes at SMU, it was a good opportunity for me to kind of bring in, um, you know, what I know best from my time at Waterloo and my time at Carleton as a player and kind of things I've developed over my own coaching career um, in terms of, of scheme and philosophy. But the, the other thing that I think is, is sometimes overlooked um, is the staff that we bring in. So that's something I've been working really, really hard on recently is, is getting the right coaches in place. And I'm, I'm really excited about the staff that I have, but uh, it starts with communication. And are we all speaking the same terminology? You know, do we all have the same beliefs? Are we all, are we all bought into this philosophy? It goes back to that buying thing we were talking about before. You know, if, if I can get, you know, as a coordinator, um, you know, the relationships that we build with players is one thing, but as a positional coach, you get really, really tight with your group. And if we're all, you know, spitting the same message, if we're all, you know, spewing the same philosophy and the same beliefs uh, as a staff, I think that's when we really, really build success. So there's player evaluation definitely in terms of of talent and character. Um, But I think there's also has to be a large amount of staff evaluation in terms of philosophy and character, uh, strengths and weaknesses, and and putting guys in the best position to succeed, not only as, as a player group, but also a coaching group. For sure. And I think that that message piece is so important, especially when you're, you know, installing a new playbook. And for a lot of, you know, high school and summer league coaches, it's really like you're installing a new playbook every year, right? You get such a short amount of time with your guys. You know, if you make a great playoff run, you might play eight, 10 high school games in a year, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so you have them for 10, 12 weeks, three months. Right. And even if you have a great offseason program, you know, really at best, you're working with those guys on the football field for, you know, a third of the year. Right. So making sure you always come back to and we have this in summer ball all the time. Right. We have new coaches every year. We have, you know, different people involved and and they bring different strengths and, and different philosophies and beliefs to the table. So I think it's super important that you get that communication from the head coach to the coordinators. And then that's what you're delivering to your players. Right. What you deliver as the OC or DC to your players is great. But if that's not echoed by those guys that are in their unit that they have that relationship with, it's hard to create that consistency. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. You know, that was one of, again, one of the other things that really tracked me. Coach, Coach James Colsey, the head coach at at SMU here, he, he does a great job. You know, his energy, his passion, his philosophy, he's very blunt. He's to the point. He lets you know what he wants. Um, 
you know, not as only as a coach, but for to his entire team as, as a player group. And again, as coordinators, we need to echo it. As positional coaches, we need to echo it. And can our philosophies and, and ideologies match? And um, you know, I, I'm confident that we found a. You know, I feel like I found a good fit here at SMU, and I'm looking forward to getting to work with these guys. Um, but that's exactly it. It all comes down to the message, and like you said, repeat it. It's going to hear it. We're going to hear it a hundred more times by the end of this. But the buy-in from guys. That, that's everything to me. Yeah, for sure. And you wind up in a situation where if you can all speak the same language and you've decided on what you feel as a staff is important, kind of making those weekly decisions gets a lot easier, right? Because you have that foundation of this is who we want to be. This is These are the offensive principles we want to stick to. And, and it really helps you keep things consistent throughout the year. And, and that's where that belief comes from, right? If guys don't believe in a message they just heard for the first time on Thursday. Right. Mm-hmm. You, it's got to it's got to start from, you know, your offseason program, training camp, build through the year. And, and I think that that's that really is what creates that type of belief that you need, you know, any good team needs when when you get into the fourth quarter of a close game. Uh, exactly. in, in terms of taking that into your playbook now, you know, obviously every coach that listens to this or watches this is going to have different X's and O's that they believe in. How do you kind of in today's day and age with with so many different options on what you could run and different things, you know, you can run RPO, you can run play action, bootleg, this, that screen, quick screen, you know, there's so many different things, pieces to your offense that you can add. You got all the air raid stuff going on down in the States. How do you kind of try and take all that information and build simplicity into your offense? Um, I think number one, it starts with uh, my biggest kind of, I believe our biggest weapon as coaches is our naming conventions. So, what do we name our, our concepts, um, you know, and how do we teach these through? So, you know, to give you an example, you know, for, for me, inside zone, you can run inside zone, you know, the concept of inside zone remains the same, but we can run it 30 or 40 different ways, which then evaluates into 40 or 50 different plays, right? You can have your split zone, you can have your insert zone, uh, you could have your full on wham, you can have your slips, whatever it is that you run with your inside zone. To me, the concept remains the same. So, um, regardless of, of, you know, what we're taking with inside zone for me, we call it Rhino, right? It's, it's our run inside, R-I-N, Rhino, run inside, inside zone. And then we'll have our tags off of it. Like I said, we can have our inserts, we can have our whams, we can have our slips, but I want guys, no matter what we tag it with, it is still Rhino. It is the same concept, uh, you know, same with our outside zone. Again, same with our flood concepts, right? We would call those, for example, Ford. Um, you know, that naming convention that I hear the F and I hear the F and O of the Ford and the flood. Perfect. I'm good to go. And then we can take it to very different route combinations with it or whatever it is. Um, you know, our curls, we call it Chrysler, the, the CHR, the CR and curls and Chrysler, you know, our spacing concept. How do we want to space it out with our curls? Um, and then again, like I said, we can take it with different things. But naming conventions to me, I think, are our biggest weapon. This is something that I started doing coaching younger kids. Um, you know, 10 to 12, 12 to 14, 15 to 16, 17, so on and so forth. And it's something that, you know, if we can teach, if I can have 13, 14 and 15 year olds running the same concepts we're running at a university level, um, you know, based on simplifying naming conventions, I think we're doing something right as coaches. The less thinking our players do, the better, the better they play. I, yeah, I believe, sure. you know, yeah, I believe thinking is where we're supposed to be the thinkers. The only time I want my players thinking is when they come off the field and we're having conversations. That's it. Other than that, I want it to become natural. I want them I want them to be great at what they're doing and just know it like the back of their hand from repetition. Um, you know, not not you've heard this before a hundred times, I'm sure, but I want us to be great at something, not good at everything. And once yeah. once you become great at something, it becomes easy. You don't have to think about it. It's second nature, it's like riding a bike. Right? You just do it on repetition over and over. And then like we talked about, if you can understand concept. Um, you know, fo- football's an ever-changing game. Defenses aren't stagnant, right? They're always moving, whether you're getting whatever kind of coverage it is in the back end, blitz packages, front packages, whatever it is, personnel packages. Um, you know, if we can understand concept, um, it makes it so easy to adapt to what we're seeing across from us instead of, again, memorizing sticks, memorizing that, okay, on this play, if I'm running the, I'm running the post at 12 yards, well, sometimes you might have to push that post a little bit skinnier you might have to push it a little bit fatter. You might have to break it at 14 or step on the toes of the safety or whatever it is that we teach in that certain concept. Um, but if you can understand concept rather than memorizing a playbook, I think that's when you really start to, to feel success. 
Yeah, and I think the the naming conventions thing is something like as football's changed, right? Like you have this theme, you know, like a smash concept, right? That's been called smash forever. So people just always keep calling stuff kind of how they learned it. I think yep. what some of the great stuff and some of the no huddle stuff is, has brought in is it forced guys to change how they communicate because they want to play faster. So then yep. you get into these these naming conventions and trying to group ideas. You know what I mean? And I think that that's done wonders for our game. Like like you said, I, I had a great experience. When I was still – I think I was still playing at Laurie at the time. And in the summer, I'd go home from Guelph and I was coaching Guelph minor football at the time. And we were coaching a JV team and we were running no huddle and, you know, different personnels, different um, formations. And, you know, I think there's a lot of guys that looked at me at the start when we started to do that. The players were like, okay, this is going to be, you know, you want to do what again? Like that's, you know, that's a lot for a JV football team. But in the end, you know, the naming conventions helped us simplify that a bit. And, you know, I think that that really allows people to connect ideas and that creates that confidence you're talking about, right? When you can take the concept of inside zone and you, you know, you add an insert to it or you add a wham block to it or a slip while you're trying to process and learn that, whether it's on the whiteboard in meetings or walk through whatever you have that anchor of, okay, I, I know this about inside zone. So mm-hmm. we're adding this player or we're taking this player out of the concept, whatever it is. I know two thirds of what we're doing already. Now I just need to focus on learning how that tag adapts the concept. Right. And I I think that's where some people miss, you know, Hey, we're going to call this play this and not play that. Well, if you're going to run them both and they have 80% similarity, you should try and find a way to connect that for your athletes versus just calling it. You learned the one play from one coach and it was called, you know, smash and you learned the other play from another coach and it was called verts. But if they have, this in combination, you should try and link them and, and create some word association that way. Agreed. I think, you know, if we can, you know, as, as I know you're a guy that's involved in community football and myself as well. Like if we can, can get younger players to start to understand concepts, you know, at 12 to 15 years old, you know, or 12 to 18 by the time they enter university, they're way more prepared. You know, I'm speaking on my, you know, when I first got into, into at Carleton, you know, we started talking about inside zone and it was mind blowing to me. I had run it in high school, but I didn't know it was inside zone. I just, I don't remember what we called it at the time in high school, but I just thought it was that play, you know, and then we ran multiple variations of it at Carleton, but it was, it was mind blowing to me that though, this is an inside zone concept, you know, and these are the different ways you can attack with this or our outside zone or vice versa. Right. It's um, I think it's something that if we can continue to teach younger kids, it makes them better prepared for the next level. And then it makes that transition easier. And again, learning new playbooks easier. You can go into any, I'm sure if you and I sat down and I handed you my playbook as a guy who understands concepts, you'd be able to learn it pretty quick. So we've talked about, you know, trying to be conceptually based and using naming conventions to create some simplicity for your players. Do you want to show us a quick couple of examples on how maybe you do that within a concept in your offense? Definitely. Um, we'll, we'll kind of, we'll touch on inside zone. So kind of like I spoke about earlier, you know, we call our inside zone Rhino. So, uh, you know, the run, is the big R here and then the IN tells us it's inside. Um, You know, for us right now, this green tells us we're going to the strong side and then our deuce is our formation. So, uh, you know, our deuce is our 22 set with a two back. So uh, this is just your base inside zone. We've all seen it before, front side double teams. We want to create as many doubles as possible, pushing up second level, uh, you know, creating vertical push or lateral wash with a backside read. Uh, In this one here, I have it as a true quarterback keep read option. Um, but it's something where we can take some kind of passing concept on the backside if we want to treat it into a double option. Um, so, like I said, we call this, you know, Rhino is our inside zone, and we can do it with multiple different variations. So, you know, as an example, we can add a wham onto it. So our, what we call our wham is our fullback coming backside and kicking out the backside end. Um, this is something where we still keep it as Rhino. So, we will still call this Deuce Green Rhino, just like we did in the last play. The only difference is now we've added a wham block to it. That's the tag that we'll add onto our call. So for our players, um, conceptually, it remains the same. For our quarterback, it's still the same look. The only difference is now we don't have a true read on the backside end. And for our O-line, some teams run in different ways where you'll push it to the front side, your double teams, or you push it to the backside. I preferably like to push it to the backside and get a read from our tailback on the SAM. Um, but it's that little tag, that wham tag, 
has now taught us, okay, there's a little bit of a tweak, but the inside zone concept remains the same. Another way we can do it is what I like to call a whack. It's the exact same as our wham. The only difference is now it's a receiver adding into the box and coming on that backside end block. Still an inside zone concept. And that's so Another important. Way. Sorry, that's so important when you get to you're playing a defense that maybe you didn't prepare for or they're running, you know, something that they've run before, but you know, into out of a different look. And it just allows your guys to have so much more confidence in what they're doing. Well, exactly, right? And then, you know, another way of, of doing it is with that slip game, which I like to call our wave, right? So our wave is now our receiver coming across the box. We're still playing that inside zone look up front, right? Our tailback, our quarterback, we're all selling that inside zone look. Uh, we're playing a true read on our end here with the slip game, and then we can turn it into the pass or the run based off what, what our quarterback reads. But, you know, these are all the same concept. But we've now had one, two, three, four different plays off of it. Um, so if we can get guys to understand the inside zone concept, which again is you know creating as many double teams as possible, the point of attack, getting as many guys up to second level as possible, uh, you know vertical push and lateral wash. You know, we can get into details of tailback reads and all that fun stuff if we wanted. But um, you know it's it's all the same thing, just with separate tags on it. Right. So it's something that, you know, for me, I really, really like guys to understand, you know, and we, if we went through this, you know, this is a sample playbook. If we went through this, we could find multiple variations of the same kind of thing where it's one concept, but run multiple ways. That almost gives you a different kind of look. For sure. And that's where, especially when you're trying to get the most out of, you know, your, your players, I mean, whether it's a high school setting or a university setting, you can find different ways to dress up those simple plays and to your opponent, you know, you're, it's different to defend. You're creating a different surface, you're running it out of emotion. You know, you're, you're blocking a player versus reading a player. Um, the quarterback can pass off it, RPO, whatever it is. But now to your guys, it's just inside zone with this little thing added to it versus, Oh yeah, exactly. that's, that's a totally different play. I need to learn, you know, not just what I'm doing, but how that relates to other people's jobs. You create that context. And, you know, I think that that's something that when people are looking for that secret sauce all the time on what helps your guys play fast, it's those little things you can build into your offense that really allow them to do that. Well, exactly. I think, I think you nailed it with saying how to the defense, it looks completely different, right? So, you know, for example, in our wham here, the reason I like to push it to the backside is I want to get the read on the Sam. Some teams play bump when they see that wham coming. Some will play that Sam lock on the fullback, right? If you play that Sam lock on the fullback, you can't be right. We've outgapped you now, right? If you want to chase that fullback across, we went to the front side. If you want to sit, we went to the back side. It's, um, you know, it's, it's difficult. The bump teams, you know, the wham look isn't great against bump unless you can push it to the front side and have your doubles pushing to the front. But it's one of those things where, you know, we want to – this – without the wham and this with the wham they're the same play but we can attack you in different ways and it creates room you know especially like i think in a summer ball context you get two practices a week right you want to create some stuff that helps your guys you know be successful but you don't want to put them in situations where they're constantly having to learn new stuff i think taking some time as a coach and like we talked about deciding on what you believe is important and how that relates to your players evaluating who you're coaching and, and what they can do and what maybe they could learn to do versus what's not a good fit for what their skill sets are. And then trying to create simplicity through the, the use of those naming conventions, like you talked about and, and teaching conceptually. I think that that's a lot of, when you look at a lot of the good offenses in any league, right? It's, it's simple stuff made to look really complicated. And, and that's something I think that, especially with unlimited emotion in the Canadian game, man, you can get into so many different, things yep. that building that that sense of a foundation for your players is so important agreed you know it's and i think you you nailed it by saying like at the end of the day if we're a great inside zone team right if that's what our o-line is best at and that's what our running back is best at running um you know now we've opened up several different ways to run it and again you know now our playbook went from you know one play to ten but it's the same concept that is easy to remember and, and consistent with one another so it, it's huge in terms of playbook development right now. It's one thing, like I said, I'm, simplicity is the name of the game. I'm a big believer that the easier it is for our guys, the better it is. And we can we can run all of our complex concepts and find ways to keep it simple. For sure. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing that stuff with us. 
you know, all the best out at uh, St. Mary's. Hopefully, we're we're back on a field sooner rather than later. Um, you know, where can where can people find you on social media? What's the best way to to get in touch with you if they're interested in becoming a St. Mary's Husky? Uh, Twitter, Twitter, Instagram probably best. It's just uh, my name at Tommy Kanichis. Um, you can find me on either or there. Uh, Facebook as well, whatever, whatever you guys are still on, just not Snapchat. There you go. Well, I'll make, I'll make sure to throw that up there so they can, they can get a screenshot of that and know where to go for that information. So appreciate it, coach. Thanks very much. Appreciate you having me on. Have a good one, Jackson.